uh, Patrick James, thank you both very much indeed for coming along to try and look into the crystal ball for the general election that is coming towards us, though, as we sit here speaking. It might be receding a little bit um, from view. Can I just ask you, if we're in the scenario that looks plausible as we sit here, and there's a deal, but it's not quite entirely cooked, so there has to be an extension, but it might be a shortish technical extension, do you think Boris Johnson really isn't going to... We're not going to see a general election this year. He's not going to try and press that button. Uh, it, it's receding into the distance, and we're going to have lots of other scenarios to touch on. But can I just start with that one, James? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that a lot of this will depend on which faction in number 10 wins out. It feels like the vote leave faction in number 10 really does, you know, is very wedded to 31st of October, whereas there might be other groups of people, perhaps uh, Eddie Lister and other, other allies in, in Boris Johnson's number 10, who might be more open to that technical extension. I think if he does go for it, then it's difficult. It, it certainly looks like an election goes back into 2020 for two reasons. Firstly, just because of timing, because they'd want to get a deal done before and leave the EU before they had an election, but also because um, you know by that point the Brexit party may be resurgent because that 31st of October limit has been breached. Nigel Farage and the Brexit party are poised with these montage videos of Boris Johnson saying hundreds of times we're leaving on 31st of October. So if they're in that situation, I expect the Conservatives might just backtrack on how quickly they want an election after all. Patrick, how does it look to you? I mean, I, th I think that's absolutely right here. Uh, not going out on the 31st for Boris is a major problem for him with Brexit Party. Uh, I'm not surprised they've got all these videos ready to roll. Boris was so clear uh, in his leadership uh, bid and also since he's been Prime Minister that it's do or die, in his own words, 31st of October. Uh, and clearly the plan was to have an election before that. Uh, but he is victim to the same parliamentary maths as Theresa May was. Uh, this is a hung parliament and there is not a majority in parliament for a general election, so it's not in his gift. Uh, and actually, as James uh, just, just said there, the, the desire for a general election, if there is a resurgent Brexit party who can basically say he's betrayed his promises, I think probably does then push it into 2020. Mm. I would just say on that that I think that if they are able to, if they have this technical extension, you know, get it done, get get Brexit done, then have an election, they'll be okay. I mean, because was, they'll have done Brexit, they, they'll have done it. So it's quite interesting. Shot Nigel Farage's fox. Exactly, and it was quite interesting when when I was in number ten doing the polling. We had the 29th of March deadline missed. Um, but that wasn't actually when the Conservative poll rating started diving. They started diving after the 12th of April deadline was missed, and it became that longer thing. In a lot of the focus groups, voters were very laid back at the idea of a short extension just to iron out some details. It was when it became a longer delay that it became a problem. So I imagine he could actually weather the storm if he can get that far. Well, let's go through some of the numbers that churn around about how plausible it is that an election in one of these circumstances can work for Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party. Let's start with the Brexit party vote. What does Boris Johnson need it to get down to? What does he need to squeeze it by to be able to get a, a majority? And what, the, what, what that, is that looking like? I think you'd want that down to 5 or 6% really before you go for it. Uh, you got a number on that, James? So, so actually, where it is now, which is about sort of 10% or so, is, is not bad at all for the Conservatives, because Conservatives have got a double digit over Labour, and although a lot of those Brexit Party voters are ex-Conservatives, don't forget there are some ex-Labour voters in there as well. And I think some British election study research showed today that actually, although the cons a number of Conservative switches to Brexit Party has gone down, the Labour switches to Brexit Party have remained the same. So you could see in a situation, like in 2015 with UKIP, that actually the Brexit Party is hurting Labour as well as the Conservatives. So if he can keep that number where it is, or the dynamics of an election being called brings it down even further, he's probably okay on that. The problem is, is that if we haven't left the EU by the time we have an election, which let's face it is pretty likely, then it's a that's going to be start, that's going to start rising rather than falling. But Patrick, your number is based on uh, really sort of not too many. Like you, you say get the Brexit Party down to sort of six, seven percent or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But that, but that could, it could be higher than that. But with Labour, uh, I mean, there is some there is some Labour vote in it. I mean, he's absolutely yeah. right. There is some Labour vote in it. I mean, obviously, the, the, the vast majority, the, the Labour vote since twenty seventeen has gone mainly to the Liberal Democrats. But there is some that's gone Green uh, and Brexit Party as well. I mean, uh, just sort of thinking ahead to this, um, if if. You know, it, I think a lot will depend on what's in the Conservative manifesto about the performance of the Brexit party. If the Conservative manifesto in a general election where a deal has not been done still talks about a future deal, that is, that is 
ripe for the Brexit party. If they're offering essentially no deal on X date, I think that gives the Conservative Party, A, the ability to squeeze them nationally, and B, to conduct independent deals with them uh, on a seat-by-seat -seat basis in some of their marginal seats. Where are we in terms of the, the, uh, the Labour vote that the Tories need to win over in the South Yorkshire coalfields, the Midlands? Uh, how, how much of it will be a direct switch, do you estimate, James, that they need? You, you were working with Theresa May in 2017 when a lot of headway was made in terms of winning over that uh, vote. How much needs to come direct this time, as, uh, in addition to the squeezed Brexit party vote? And what are they looking like? on that front. So the first thing to say is that this is a very, very important group. Uh, when I was there, we called them the Conservative Considerers. Um, they were working class, the Northern Midlands. They actually were 60% female and 40% male, so they slightly skew more female than they do male. Um, they voted Leave, but they don't care about Brexit as much as they care about public services. Um, now, over the last two years, Conservatives have sort of, you know, notched up slowly with that with that group. Um, they really don't like Jeremy Corbyn, um, who's sort of, you know, doesn't really match their values. Um, but they are still a very tough nut to crack and ultimately they will be thinking about public services. Now in the term of how much in terms of how much it matters, yes it matters in those seats like Halifax, like Wakefield, um, uh, you know like uh, uh, Bishop Auckland. Um, but actually if the Conservatives decline less than Labour, then it doesn't really matter how much of those people they, they, they gain. They just have to hold on to those people that they won in 2017. So new converts are not necessarily a big part of the picture. They're not necessary. Now, if, again, this is all based on current polling, right? So if we're in this world post 31st of October, we haven't left, Brexit Party are taking some of those people, then the Conservatives will need to look for new votes. But as it stands, it's just it's about, you know, the Conservatives only need to hold who they've got and hope that Labour fall faster than them. And, and squeeze Brexit Party. And squeeze Brexit Party. And because the Liberal Democrats are, are so strong, that's hurting Labour more than it is the Conservatives on a national picture. So he'll be standing on a pile of voters that Theresa May bequeathed him, as it were, that made their first move under her. I'm sure he'll be very grateful to her. <laughs> he, could, he could well be. I'm not I, sure. I, I, I think it's fairly obvious to say at the next general election, the vote share for the two main parties will go down. Yeah. Uh, and it's a question of how far it goes down and who it goes to and how it plays out seat by seat. I mean, clearly the Liberal Democrats have been taking votes off Labour, principally Remain voters, uh, and that seems to be at the moment a bigger trend than what is the trend of Conservative decline, mm. and that creates swing. But if, you... ja if James is right though, Patrick, uh, that, the issue that gets talked about, that, that there are voters in traditional Northern Labour heartlands who will struggle to see Boris Johnson as the saviour of the NHS and the public services Indeed. and the rest of it. Um, but James is saying you don't necessarily need those new comments. You, you're basically talking about holding on to people who've already made that move. You're not talking about new comments. For, that for, makes, for, for is that government, right? For the government. Yeah, for the Tories. Uh, I mean, by and large, I mean, there's always a bit of flux, right? Sure. It certainly, I think, was the view in 2017 from the Conservatives, and probably is doing the circles again, is that they can make progress with these groups because they're socially conservative and they're more likely to be leavers. But they are quite stubborn and quite tribally loyal to, to Labour as well. And regardless of Jeremy's personal uh, ratings in the polls, they are instinctively towards Labour and instinctively towards Labour's policies, specifically on uh, public services and tax and spend. So it is a tough nut to crack. But like I said, I mean, if, if the Tories were able to stay within 4% of what they achieved last time, they will get a majority. And I think you will, you might also see some very surprising results in certain seats. So because of that Liberal Democrat rise, you may end up in a situation where seats you would never expect the Conservatives to win in a no deal Boris Johnson led Conservative Party election. In London, places like Croydon Central, um, you know, seats in seats in the South that voted Remain, you may see that the Conservative vote goes down, but the Labour vote is going down by much more. And that Lib Dem rise means that actually the Conservatives come through the middle. Um, and that would certainly, you know, if Conservatives are winning seats in London, that would certainly be, be, be the majority. Uh, I've, I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, some internal polling uh, from our organisation which shows that essentially in, in seats in London, right, specifically places like Battersea and Kensington, is that despite the Conservative vote going down, uh, they, they potentially can gain both them seats because the Labour vote goes further down, principally to the Liberal Democrats, and the Tories, despite going down, end up as the winner. Now there is there is one caveat to all of that, which is that if if the Liberal Democrats perform really well, they may take some of these seats. So there was an internal poll released by the Liberal Democrats today with Servation um, in in Finchley and Golders Green, where Luciana Berger has, uh, has said she'll stand, and the Lib Dems win that seat. Now, do you, do you believe that, Paul? I I do. I I I I think. I mean, Finchley is historically a Labour Conservative marginal. 
Uh, but it, it, you know, let's be honest, it, it has a very sizable Jewish community, which is, I think, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, in the country, where Labour has been struggling, if you see polling numbers on that sort of breakdown. Uh, Luciana, obviously, is standing for the Liberals. She's a former Labour figure. Uh, and it gives them a profile, and I think she's actually from that constituency as well. Let me ask a different question then. Do you believe there are a lot of Finchleys? Finch is quite unique. I think that that poll is right as it stands right now. I think in a general election, the dynamics will change. And you know, it will become a question ultimately about who do you want to be the next prime minister? Who do you realistically think is gonna win this election? And that choice is ultimately Boris Johnson, the Conservatives or Jeremy Corbyn and Labour. That will result in the Conservatives and Labour parties doing better. Um, that still means all of the things we've just talked about can happen, but I can't, it's very difficult for the Lib Dems to break through in those seats in my view. The scenario you're talking about there, where the uh, Lib Dem surge in unwinnable seats for them is just enough to harm Labour and help the Tories, how many seats does that potentially deliver? Because Dominic Cummings' calculations, presumably, if he's sitting there thinking about a majority, and given that there are expected to be losses to certain stronger Lib Dem challenges, and in Scotland, he's looking at, what, 50, 60? 70 gains? It, it, it could well be. I mean, it's interesting that... Conservative, is that plausible? It, it is plausible. It's interesting that Conservative Party actually, although they're aware of this dynamic that we've been talking about, it's interesting that they aren't actually prioritising resource to those seats. So I know some people standing in those kind of seats. What's and, going on there? And, well, I think, I think because they know it might happen by accident rather than by design. And they still, they think, and they're right, you know, that they do need to focus on those Northern Midlands seats in case something changes. So it's interesting how they're not entirely, you know, pushing the resource behind them. But it's certainly true at the moment that, as as the polls stand, that that could accidentally deliver a bigger majority to the Conservatives. But as I say, this is all based on polling about a general election taking place tomorrow. That's what people are asked in these mm -hmm. polls. Mm -hmm. You know, this could all change overnight, and you may see we might be saying the opposite thing about the other way around if the Brexit Party is resurgent. It, it, uh, it, indeed, yeah, it's all very hypothetical at the moment because essentially the context of what happens with Brexit, the situation on the ground, what's in the party manifestos, will change a lot of this. And um, let me ask you a bit about that because we just had some data from the British election study uh, looking at how fluid everything is in an election these days, how uh, voters, 50% uh, is it, of voters over the last three elections have changed their party choice, un unprecedented sort of le level of fluidity uh, in living memory. Um, where, you, James, you, you, you pondered this uh, after 2017, how much does an a surprise moment at the beginning of an election now have an impact in a way that it didn't? And what kind of level of surprise or shock? I might, I mean, given that it's a shock or a surprise, how would you know? But what, what, what could we be? Can you imagine some scenarios of the sort of things that could suddenly shift the whole game at the beginning of an election in the current sort of world that we're in? Well, that is absolutely right about, about the volatility. And actually, one of the slides I showed to the Cabinet after the 2017 election was this uh, tracking, you know, volatility from the British election study over all the general elections. I think it was only 1918 and 1931 that had higher levels of churn than the last three elections. So, you know, we are in remarkable territory. Look, campaigns are going to matter. And that was the lesson of 2017. That must have been a tough audience. Yeah. <laughs> I think somebody in the room did actually say it was the most depressing thing they'd ever heard in the room, which uh, I can probably put, probably probably shouldn't put on my CV. Um, but uh, it was, you know, this this is, campaigns matter. And, you know, these moments matter. And you saw that in 2017, and you'll see it again now. It might be the manifestos. We certainly saw that in 2017 with the Conservative manifesto and with the Labour manifesto, actually, which people warmed to and liked. Um, and it may be even in, the, even in the literal calling of an election. This is one of the interesting things that happened in 2017 when we look back um, you know when it when the question stopped becoming what do you think of Theresa May at the moment what do you think of Jeremy Corbyn at the moment what do you think of Brexit and mm -hmm. became who do you want to govern the country for the next five years you started to see people go back to Labour from day one from the Lib Dems and from the Greens so it could even be just the very you know quiet psychological thing that changes in voters minds they're no longer addressing thinking, the issue as well, yeah taking I mean, their fingers out of their ears. yeah yeah and you know they're not thinking about just what they think about politics at the moment which is a bit of a mess they're thinking about who do I want to govern me and yeah. you may see that having unexpected impacts in terms of voter movement. And the strategy for the Labour Party will be to make that happen again uh, and if they can do what they did last time it will be a lot closer as a contest than the current polls show. I mean for example they'll want to push down that Liberal Democrat vote principally the people that went from Labour to Liberal Democrat in the last year or so. How do you think they'll do that? Uh, well I'll come to that in a second but also the, the Greens are I think around five or six percent in current opinion polls. Now the, the, eff the effect of a general election will be usually to push that down to one or two percent, yeah, and they'll probably flow 
more to Labour than to anyone else. And how the Labour Party will do that is, is essentially framing the contest as a choice. It's a Labour or Conservative government. That's just the way the electoral system and maths work out. And they'll seek to basically say that you have to, you have to make a choice. And if you vote Liberal Democrat or Green, you may well end up with a Conservative government or a Conservative MP. It's the traditional sort of squeeze messages that have always been played by the major parties in, in British elections. We mentioned uh, women voters when you were talking, James, about the 60-40 advantage they have in one of the target areas. Well, how is Boris Johnson doing with uh, women voters? It looks as though he's got a problem there. Mm-hmm. It's certainly uh, certainly doing doing less well than, than he is with men. Um, we actually saw a similar thing um, with, with Theresa, May, Theresa May's ratings where um, she would actually do better with men than women um, because they actually tended to be more interested in Brexit, they tended to be more interested in immigration and some of the issues that she was talking about. So, you know, um, uh, Boris Johnson has got um, a problem in this regard um, and uh, uh, you know I imagine that a lot of that is is linked to the conservative brand on public services um, which was a big reason for why women voted Labour um, in a way that you know in, in a way that um, women had not voted Labour in those numbers before in 2017 you know this was a historical moment um, in terms of voter patterns just how many women uh, voted voted Labour um, compared to previously relative to men um, so you know they are going to have to try and address those public service issues in the same way that um, that, that, that Labour have been. Patrick. Which I mean, which I think is obviously part of the strategy, isn't it? You've seen Boris uh, in making, you know, announcements, is it four, is it 20, is it, you know, 200 hospitals, whatever it is, uh, with no financial plan, but he, he clearly is aware that there's a weakness for the Conservative brand with regard specifically to the NHS, uh, and, uh, you know, he's out there making big, big, bold noises about it. Is there anything to be said, is, is there anything that polling tells us that women uh, engage with politicians, in a, some women voters, in a different way, and that men might just look for the person who's saying the same thing as me, and women look for trust? a bit more, anything like that. I'm just trying to eat into what might be the factor for Boris Johnson, why they might not be going for him. So I definitely saw when, in, I've definitely seen in polling that um, cost of living is a much more important issue um, and uh, sort of those more personal is- issues uh, rather than the sort of macro, you know, um, big, uh, you know, Brexit narratives or, or whatever else. Um, and also the other thing is, is that don't forget that women are very, very hard to poll. Um, they, um, they are a much higher proportion of women say don't know in answers to, in answers to these questions. Um, whether that's because of engagement or anything else, I'm not sure. Honesty in answering the question. I, I, I've, always, I've watched this book through the years and the, the don't know sub breaks for, for men and women are always quite yeah. different. Yeah. And, I, and I, 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 I sort of come to the conclusion that it's basically that women are more honest to, yeah. and more happy to say they don't know when they don't know. Humility versus yeah. arrogance. Whereas men feel it's a masculine thing that they have to <laughs> yeah. have an opinion even if they don't know. <laughs> might, might, might be something to that. Um, we touched on leadership there and Boris Johnson's special characteristics maybe. Uh, if we're going into next year, There must be a chance that Jeremy Corbyn isn't there. His team will all say emphatically, of course, he will be. But the chance must develop that he Oh, I think think that's undoubtedly what's going on. I mean, there's obviously a bit of a power struggle at the top of the Labour Party at the moment. Been some significant staff changes in the last week or so. Uh, And and I think you can see now that people are starting to really see that succession is is being planned. Uh, As for who that will be, we don't know yet. But I think, you know, if... If there was a, wasn't going to be a general election until the end of the Fixed Term Parliament Act, i.e. 2022, I think we'd probably be in that contest already. Um, how would it change? I think that is, I think it would be a very significant game changer. Um, when you look underneath the figures and you run the regression analysis and the numbers on what's actually powering vote away from Labour and towards the Conservatives, I'm afraid that Jeremy Corbyn is there very, very prominently as someone who is driving votes away from the Labour Party. Um, so if that is taken out of the equation, you may suddenly see some of those Liberal Democrat votes coming back. You may well see some switches from the Conservatives to Labour. I think it would reset the Labour brand in a way that um, it hasn't been able to for the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And Patrick, you're nodding there. Even if it's a figure who is an anointed successor, as it were, um, blessed by Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Well, let's just start with that scenario. That could, that could still change the game. But it depends who it is. I mean. Uh, I mean, let, let's, if it was Keir Starmer, uh, I think we'd be in an absolute game changer here. I think he's uh, trusted and respected across the party uh, and all the factions to some degree. Plus, he is uh, very clear about where he is on Brexit and always has been. And I think that plays to the strategy for Labour, which obviously is to try and unwind this Remain vote moving to the Liberal Democrats. So I think something like that would be a, a, a huge game changer. 
But if it was one of the women that gets uh, talked about it, John McDonald's always said he thought, thinks it should be a woman uh, succeeding, but the people he's recently mentioned are Rebecca Long Bailey and Angela Rayner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think still both a game changer. Are, uh, well, it's a game changer. I think Keir would be probably a better, but I think there is a real feeling in the party that it should be a woman, and I do think it will be, and it will end up probably as one of them too. Uh, I think probably Angela's probably favourite in my book. So uh, it's interesting because I think that, uh, so, uh, and in no way, I'm, I mean, I worked, worked, worked for a Conservative Prime Minister, I'm in no way ha happy about this, but um, when we did the testing of, you know, who would be the uh, most effective Labour leader in case Jeremy Corbyn went, which we had to do a lot of, you know, we did contingency planning for everything, John McDonnell was the person who polled the best. Because people thought. Did you fall off your chair? Competent. I did, I, did I slightly. That was your working assumption. Yeah, no, it wasn't my working assumption. And, you know, it's because he looks competent. He looks on top of his brief. Mm -hmm. um, people sort of described him as a sort of bank manager star figure. Um, and the sort of, you know, the things that uh, pundits might be concerned about him, you know, his past or his hard left, you know, positions, um, that's not, that wasn't the problem. Um, the, you know, the, the problem uh, with Corbyn is that they think he's a bit uh, incompetent, whereas John McDonald sort of solved that issue for them while keeping that radical left position mm. that excites the activists and gets people involved. I do wonder, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying Keir Starmer is one of these people, but I do wonder that if Labour go for a, a, a moderate and you know, go back a little bit pre-Corbyn to that sort of politician, they may well just lose some of that excitement they receive from younger voters and from, and from the left in 2017. You're nodding, Patrick. I, well, I mean, I, I don't disagree with what he says. I mean, John is clearly, uh, both in the eyes of the public and of the party, the competent face of the Corbyn project uh, and effectively has taken, I think, personal control of operations over in Jeremy's office in the last week or so uh, as he attempts to sort of get the organisation ready for a general election. As for him being leader, I'm not sure, I don't actually see the technical way that he could do that because, for example, in the Constitutional Labour Party, if Jeremy stood down, it would be the deputy leader that takes that role in an acting basis. Uh, even though that's probably unpopular with some people around Jeremy, that, that is the rule book. Uh, but also, in terms of how you get elected, Labour has this uh, complicated structure for electing uh, leaders now, which have low nominations in Parliament, but you also have this mass membership, and then you've got the people that can pay a small fee to join as well, and they are predominantly to the left of the party. And I'm so, guessing, you know, given it, some it of the o it. office changes you've been talking about, Len McCluskey wouldn't be mad keen on... Uh, John McDonnell. I don't think so. Uh, I'm reading between the lines. We can rule him out from the, nom from the nomination papers, I think. So just going back, back to our original sort of scenarios, though, what happens in a general election where Brexit has happened to the Labour Party and the Lib Dems? So I think that this is uh, something where a lot of people assume that, you know, if Boris Johnson gets Brexit sorted and he's going to ride into this election and it's going to be fantastic. But you know, voters don't often judge for you for what you've done. They're always looking for the next thing. And actually there are a few, you know, although I do think he will get a deal boost, there is a question about what happens in that election because a few things change. The first thing is the Conservatives lose their edge with those kind of voters we were talking about and saying, you know, we need to get Brexit done. We need to get Brexit done so we can get onto these public services you care about. They lose that message edge because Brexit is, is done. The Liberal Democrats perhaps lose some of their potency because although they might be saying, you know, yes, we need to go back in uh, to the EU. That's a two-generation uh, project, perhaps. Yeah, it's a two-generation project. And I, I can't stress enough that, you know, from all of the testing and research that I've done, that the, when we do leave, if slash when we do leave, the psychological impact of that with voters will be, will be enormous. And though there will be a phase two and though there will be more trade deals and though there will be more Brexit talk for months and months and years and years, the psychological effect of actually leaving will mean that voters will just move on by default. And that just makes things a little bit tougher for the Conservatives because it comes back to domestic issues. Now, they may still be able to ride it out. They may go back to economic competence, an argument that they used in 2015. They may go back to leadership and the contrast with Corbyn. The Brexit party vote presumably is gone. So there are, way, there are routes to victory, but it's not quite as straightforward as some are making out. Mm, yeah, I mean, again, it's, uh, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in the next few weeks, let alone post <laughs> post brexit right you know it seems it always seems to be nearly there but like a f further further <laughs> further few months every time i mean I, I think post i mean let's say there probably isn't post brexit this thing is going to go on forever but in a scenario where we have left i think it poses significant problems for the labor party actually uh, as as well as uh, the problems you just mentioned because i'm pretty sure that the liberal democrats policy will be to go back in soon as possible and we know out we know out there there is a large population of of of, of, of in the country maybe 30 40% of our 
really keen that we remain in the European Union. Uh, Labour will need to decide what its policy is. Now, I suspect it won't want to basically say we want to reopen this and have another referendum to go back in immediately, yeah? But, there, but, but quite a lot of its base and supporters will then be attracted to the Liberal Democrats. As I imagine Labour and both the Conservatives will say we have, we have to respect this now and we have to make it work. Uh, and that will be a problem for Labour. It, it, some of your bits of your answers are making me wonder whether the, the, what we've been told about how politics is moving to culture, uh, cultural politics, uh, away from economic politics, and people identify with the referendum and the vote and the rest of it. Some of some bits of your answers make me think that that's just a moment, not an era, that we're moving into, and actually it pings back to something familiar. The other side, I'm not which, sure. Which I'm is not right. Sure. If, you, if you look at the, what's happened to Scotland, uh, the, the 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 lines from the twenty. Uh, 2014 referendum five years later are still very clear. People describe themselves as, you know, a yes and no people in a way that, in, in, in you know, the whole of the UK now, we're split on these remain and leave. Or, leave or, I, I, I can't see that going any time quick. Yes, domestic policy will come back into it, absolutely. But these fundamental issues are going to be with us for... There'll be gravitational the, forces yeah, for at people. at least the medium term. So I think I think cultural issues will definitely still be important in terms of um, impact of immigration, in terms of fairness and a feeling that you know business isn't working, you know playing by the rules, all those kind of things. They definitely all still matter. But I do think that uh, my, my view on this is that the British people's view towards Brexit is actually less culture war, less divided than gets than sometimes gets gets made out in Westminster or indeed Westminster itself. People are more bored. By Brexit than than angry or you know torch bearing yeah. heading to a parade yeah and you know I think that there are when you look at the when you look at um, uh, the top issues facing that people say matter to them we look at them in the U S and you look at them for Democrats and Republicans they are immensely different you know Democrats uh, you know the environment Republicans the economy you know no, there's no common issue in the U K the top issue for both of those groups once you take Brexit out is the NHS. Um, so there are places of consensus that we might be able to get back to and that Remain and Leave voters alike might be able to get back to. My hunch is that uh, that polarisation that we see in the US hasn't gripped the UK yet. And when I would do focus groups, you know, I would go to places, you know, with people who would, you would describe as liberal, young, you know, people 25 to 45 who were liberal and go to places which were, you know, much more conservative. And under the surface, there was, they had much more in common than they had apart. Now, if we have another three years of this polarisation in Westminster, as happened in the US, that will track onto the public at some point. I, I just think America is radically different to Britain mm. in terms of uh, in terms of society, and I don't think they they, they compare. Mm. Uh, but uh, but I th but but you know I think that the uh, I think the British where we are at the moment in the British system is that actually you know people are more bored than betrayed, and they want this thing done. And I think the psychological impact of leaving, though yes, the debates will still rage may well just mean that we can get back to some sense of normality. Culture matters absolutely, but not necessarily Brexit. We can't finish without talking about one other type of uh, encounter with the electorate, another referendum. If there is to be a delay and this government crashes through the October 31st barrier, some people will think there's still a moment to sort of fuse the issue of either passing a deal that Boris Johnson's come up with or somehow getting a vote in Parliament who knows how it's actually implemented by what government and all the rest of it, but to get another referendum. What are the chances looking like, Patrick, of I think it's uh, the chances happening? are uh, I think the chances are increasing. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the Parliament's not been able to vote for any single option on Brexit, but it's pretty much clear that it's opposed to everything that's been put in front of it. So I think you know we may well end up in a situation, it's quite plausible within the next week or so, that a deal can be brought, or a variant of a deal, or at least an agreement can be brought, subject to a referendum. Uh, I think that is a growing possibility. And what would be the result? Uh, well, I think the first question is, what is the question, Gary? What's on the ballot paper? So let's say, well, if there's a deal, it would be the deal versus Remain, presumably. Well, I think Remain would win quite comfortably. If it's the current deal in outline that we yeah, think it is. Yeah, I, I mean, my, my, my view is that Remain is stronger against a specific form of Brexit that can be, you know, very clearly analysed and, and tested. Uh, where, where it struggled is against a concept called leave that can be whatever anybody wants it to be. It can be the greatest free trade in the world. It can be access to single market. It can be hard Brexit all at the same time. Yeah, and that's what happened last time. So I think, you know, as long as it is a clearly defined version of leave, ideally the government's deal versus Remain. I think Remain would be strong favourites. 
James? I, so certainly, if you look at the polls now, and you know, and you look at polling referendum, you know, it's 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 pretty much you know sort of fifty two forty eight to remain. Um, uh, uh, as the simple as, question remains as, 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 as the simple question, which, which it won't be. But I, I I think I think that I think I think I think Patrick's right that you know a, a specific version of Brexit is easier to challenge than than the than the general. But I think it depends on who's making the argument for for the deal. If we're in a situation where half of the sort of prominent levers are saying no, we want no deal, and the other half are saying yeah, have this deal, and you don't have people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, you don't have people like Boris Johnson, you know, you don't have people who voters think of as levers supporting it, then I think you know, then then that that deal will be in trouble. But if levers are able to coalesce around something, then I do think it will be competitive. And I think that the uh, the key argument um, that the aside on this on in this campaign would need to make is closure. And that's the thing that the British public want the most. If so it's which side can win that label? Uh, that, that, that's my view. I think that if you, that's the that's, if that, in my view, is the top line of British public opinion at the moment. We're fed up and we want this done. Now you could see that the Leave camp could make the argument of, you know, look, we've got this deal. We're there. Parliament have tacked on this referendum at the last minute. Come on, let's get this over the line. And the Remain camp could easily go, make it stop. Yeah, you know, I mean, let's I, go back. I, you know, I, I don't think there's a strong way that the Remain campaign can say, look, listen. We've had enough. We've spent four, four wasted years when we haven't been focusing on sorting out the problems in our country. Let's press stop on this and let's sort out Britain instead. The question then becomes. I'm sorry, but one, one, one other point here is like in that in that referendum, if it's let's say a government backed deal, yeah. Uh, 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 what, what the last thing they want is Farage going around the country saying that this deal is this deal is betrayal and surrender. Uh, they do need this united front where all the levers are on the same page, which means that they're probably going for a, a hard deal version, which is not what Boris is currently negotiating. No, I agree with Put that. Put Boris's deal on the ballot paper now and you'll have the Brexit party and Farage calling it a betrayal. Will you be donning Patrick a blueberry with yellow stars, as it were, metaphorically, maybe, for this campaign, because a lot of people feel uh, there was no love for Europe in oh, I mean, the I think, last I think, campaign. I mean, or will it be it, the, the, the neutral next campaign, again, pragmatic? It has to be different, right? I think anybody who reflects on the last campaign knows that the next campaign needs to make a positive uh, case for staying in Europe. It needs to be more emotional and it needs to be less project fear. And the, also the carriers also need to be different. We had a campaign, rightly or wrongly, fronted by uh, David Cameron and George Osborne, which was largely trying to speak to uh, the Labour voters across the country uh, without senior Labour figures in that campaign. Now, there's a lot of politics about why that was, right? But I think that's that, another whole podcast. That's, that's a whole book for Tim <laughs> Shipman on that one. <laughs> but, but that can't happen next time. But the, the mistake that both camps can make in this in this in this referendum is that the Leave campaign could do a sort of you know very populist you know just tell them again you know you told them once do it again and the Remain camp could go for a very pro Europe very sort of you know Brexit was never deliverable kind of message. I think both of those are very good core vote strategies, but I'm not convinced either of those vote, that either of those strategies wins. The way you win is by getting those swing voters in the middle, and as I said earlier. Those vote. Those are the voters who just want just closure. Want over. And the question will be though: Can the Leave camp? Can the Remain camp have the discipline to? And remember, the Remain camp will be making this as their great last chance to save the European project. Can they be disciplined enough to go off the polling and have that? Let's face it, more bland argument of make it stop rather than save the EU. I think the former is a much more effective argument than the, than the latter. Thank you both very much indeed. You. Both think that the, what everybody wants is for Brexit to stop, but on this podcast, it never does. No. Very grateful for your time. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for chatting to us.